This episode of the Digital Tourism Show was brought to you today by Rentrax, fully customizable rental management systems for tour operators. You can book your free demo at rentrax.com. Hi everyone and welcome to another edition of the Digital Tourism Show. In this episode, I have the pleasure of speaking with Alex Bainbridge of Autura. And in this discussion, we discuss in length about the rise of the AI Tour Guide. Now, I know what a lot of you are thinking, that AI Tour Guides will never take off. It's probably going to be bad for the industry. Uh, there's always going to be that human-to-human -human contact when it comes to tours. Nothing will beat that. And I agree with you, nothing will beat that. But what the AI Tour Guide does is it allows you to expand your service and expand your reach to other people you would not necessarily serve, especially those who maybe don't speak in your native language. So think of an AI Tour Guide as an audio tour. It's simply like that, but with a, a sort of live AI directing you around a particular area. So in my opinion, there will always be that human-to-human -human aspect. But the AI tour guide is going to extend what you can offer, reach people that you would not necessarily reach, and generate extra revenue for your business. But Alex gives some interesting, interesting insights into what he thinks is going to happen with AI tour guides, combined with autonomous vehicles and autonomous vehicle tours. And it makes for some interesting chats. So if you're interested in to know what the future holds for tours and activities, this is an episode you do not want to miss. So welcome to the Digital Tourism Show, episode 251. Uh, I've just unmuted you there, Alex. How are we? How's things? Good, good. Good evening. Hello, Glasgow. Hello, world. <laughs> yeah, of course, you all know this is Travel Massive because of the beauty of what we're doing now and, and the beauty of Travel Massive. We're all over the world. We have people watching from every corner. Even even Ian from Travel Massive is, is watching from wherever he is now, probably Sydney or I know he travels around a lot. So yeah, pretty much uh, every corner of the globe. So <laughs> so, uh, so uh, thank you so much for again for joining us, Alex. Um, it was actually, I think the last time we spoke, well, we talked about Artura. Um, no, which, for those who don't remember, is, is a platform for autonomous sightseeing uh, using autonomous vehicles. Um, uh, and you discussed about the, the future of autonomous vehicles back then. That was actually about 20 months ago. That's how long mm -hmm. ago. And you actually flew up to Glasgow for that. So uh, uh, thank you so much for that. So so tell everyone how, how things have progressed a little bit since or over that period, over the last 20, 20 months, uh, and, and what your, how your tour is doing at the moment. Yeah. Um, well, 20 months seems like only yesterday, but it does, uh, uh, because of six months of that, I seem to have been sat behind the same desk. Um, but yeah, so for, for the last 20 months, what have I been doing? I've been really focusing on completing the platform, or Tora, which I'll talk about shortly, and, and really getting the tech right. It, it turns out that you know, building these sort of industry uh, level platforms is two to three years work. Um, so it has taken, it has taken really since early 2018 to get to now, to get to the point where um, we have some tech that actually does all the things it's meant to do. Um, but, but the other sort of the core thing that's happened in the last 20 months is I've become more confident that this is the future for tour guides uh, globally. Um, so 20 months ago when I was talking about it, um, I, you know, it was a good hypothesis. There was a good chance it was going to be right, but you couldn't really be confident totally that it was mm. the right thing for, for me to be doing. Uh, but now uh, I am uh, I'm much more confident that this is going to be the fourth digital change that happens uh, to, to, to sightseeing. If you think about the previous three, we have web, the web uh, in 2000, which brought us e-commerce. Mm -hmm. Then you have mobile which brought us a uh, reservation system connectivity because you needed to be connected to with a, your res system needed to be connected to an OTA in order uh, in order for you to take a mobile transaction at the last minute. And then social, which brought us sort of Airbnb and person to person experiences. So those are the three fundamental changes that have happened in the last 20 years. And the last one happened about 10 years ago. So we've been overdue. Uh, sort of the next big change that happens. And I think AI 
and autonomous vehicles will be the fourth large change that happens uh, to to the tours and activities and sightseeing mm -hmm. sector. So I've grown in confidence that that is the case. You know, Excellent there were other candidates. Have... So, for example, it could have been blockchain, or it could have been. Uh, augmented reality or virtual reality, but I think it's going to be AI and autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking about AI, you know, that's um, sort of leads nicely on to my next question in terms of, you've been working on a, and forgive me for my, for my layman terms, but what I would consider an AI tour guide, mm -hmm. uh, if, if you can call it that, and it's called SARA, is that correct? Yeah. Um, so yeah, yes, so that was an acronym for Sightseeing Autonomous Hospitality Robot by Autora. There we are. So, <laughs> there we go. I don't. I don't expect anyone to actually know that. Uh, but there we are. Is, she is. She, not it. She. She is yeah. an acronym. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, I didn't know that myself. There we go. Uh, so you describe her as uh, a digital human, someone, uh, and, I, and I quote: someone who acts as an assistant, a concierge, a tour guide while traveling at home or abroad. Now, personally, I can see how how. A digital human fits in with a ton of sightseeing and, and that side of things, but but you see many other opportunities for Sarah. Uh, if you can sort of maybe just dive into a few of them in terms of how you can see that going forward, not just in autonomous vehicles. Yeah. So the so the wider shift that Sarah fits into is if you think back to pre two thousand pre e commerce that I was just talking about, mm -hmm. it was all um, human transactions, human delivery. So you would make your booking by going to a hotel concierge, by going to a visitor center, and you would um, hand over your cash or credit card, and you would uh, buy, and then you would ultimately you receive a tour, and it would be uh, delivered by a tour guide. Uh, and then we sort of had a 10, 15-year period where we shifted to digital retail, human delivery. So mm -hmm. it was all online distribution, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the same product, it was the same product that was previously booked face to face. But now this whole sort of this whole new area of uh, work, we, we start talking about digital product. So that so we now shift to sort of digital retail, digital product. And that that's what is the fun, fundamental sort of opportunity and change. So what does having a digital product in terms of a digital tour mean? In, uh, when you compare that to a human-led uh, tour. So mm -hmm. all of those opportunities, not completely clear what those opportunities are, but I think there's two fundamental ones. And the first, uh, the first, fu first fundamental change is it enables us to go to the long tail. It enables us to offer tours that would not otherwise be commercially viable. So for, at the moment, if you've got a larger bus or even a minibus, you, would have, to, you have to fill it with people. And in order to fill it with people, you have to have a sort of popular experience. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you don't have to fill a bus with everyone on the same product, you can start having quite different products that only a handful of people a month might like. So if you think about um, sort of, you know, 100 years ago when you went to the, and you wanted to go out to the theater or you wanted to go to the cinema 50 years ago, there wouldn't be that much on. And now you can load up Spotify, you can load up Netflix, and there are tens of thousands of things to choose from. So yeah. that's where we might end up. So today you go to a destination and when you get out of the big cities, you might find a, lo a, a location that might not have any tours at all because there's just not, so there's not enough uh, volume of people to be commercially viable to run a, a commercial sightseeing operation. So we can go into places where you would not otherwise run a tour. And I think that's sort of one opportunity. And those topics can be long tail. So if you wanted a, uh, a jazz tour of Glasgow and you could not make that commercially viable, you could make it commercially viable if you remove the human from the, from the delivery. Uh, and that really comes up to the, sort of the second key change, which is fundamentally we can go to zero price. So in the end, because it's a piece of digital delivery with no marginal cost for the delivery of that experience, we can price this at zero. So how does that 
compare to a human human led tour where someone might have a food tour and it might be 50 pounds 75 dollars whatever mm -hmm. and someone pays that well a, an ai tour guide can deliver that at zero of course the customer's still got to pay for their food um but ultimately we can go to zero price and that that when you when you start being able to offer the same experiences that a human tour guide can offer today and you start going down to zero price that again can just change um it can change sort of all sorts of different aspects of change you know who who wants those tours and in this world for example and currently we're, we're, we're talking about a massive shift to locals buying from locals well actually locals will take a free or a zero priced experience when they would not have paid for a food tour of Glasgow, or they would not have paid for a jazz tour of Glasgow, mm -hmm. but they may take a free one. So in this in this kind of COVID world, the the, con the ability to be able to go to a zero price is um, is pretty interesting. So on that, um, just so I understand and, and, and the listeners and the watchers understand, if, if you were to go to zero price, how do tour operators make money? <laughs> I suppose that, that question yeah. will get asked, I suppose. That is a good question. Um, I mean, the, all the audio tour companies have all gone with priced products. So you mm -hmm. you spend, you know, you, you do an in-app purchase, 30% of that goes to Apple or Android. Um, and you... I'm just mentioning that because that's a very topical debate at the moment it in terms is. of um, <laughs> how much money goes to app stores. Um, but you pay sort of, you know, you're going to pay £10, $15 for an in-app purchase. Uh, and, and, and we've decided, right, go to zero because if you've got no marginal cost, you may as well go to zero. How do, how do companies uh, make money out of that? Well, we make it out of the other things that a customer will do during their trip. So if, for example, they go into an attraction, our attractions can't be replaced by AI tour guides. So an attraction would be on standard 15, 20, 25% commission. And we would then share that back with the tour operator. So if the tour operator was doing a half day experience in Glasgow and it incorporated going to a museum or incorporated going to an attraction, it's that commission that is that's that's what pays for the uh, the platform and pays for the um, pay and, and pays the tour operator. Mm -hmm. right, okay. So it's a different it's a different model. It's a trans it's still it's yeah. it's an OTA model, uh, yeah. but running yeah. tours. So yeah. it's a lot stuck stuck between the two really. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I, I suppose you no. Know, with that, you no. Know, some operators or, or activity providers or whoever may be listening to this maybe think, "Oh, Christ, our, our livelihoods are on the line here." And especially now, after everything else that's going, that's going on, but you, you, as you mentioned, you see it more of as an opportunity for them to reach a wider audience and possibly even. In, although we're mentioning zero price there, but there is opportunities there for them to increase their revenue streams because they can serve more people. They can do other things. So you see. Sarah, uh, as a way to um, would, would, would help them rather than hinder them. Mm -hmm. and how do you see that now, especially now with everything going on? Obviously, a lot of tour operators are nervous just now. So how do you see something like Sarah helping them to generate revenue and create those streams and reach a wider audience? Yeah, so I think there's really two sort of key key parts to, to, to thinking about what you've just asked. Um, the first is, I mean, my background is I spent, uh, you know, 15 years as the CEO of, uh, at the time, the largest uh, reservation platform for tours and activities and we were nothing without our tour operators mm -hmm. if we didn't have tour operators we didn't have a business the slight difference between this and previous uh, businesses is that this we can work with travel writers and travel bloggers to deliver to create routes so we kind of have the same uh, reciprocal relationship with tour operators as I had when I was running a reservation system. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I absolutely want to help tour operators. My my background is I've always been in the, on the supplier side of technology, um, but we don't have to. But I would like to, and so so I I need to convince tour operators that they want to use this platform. But if they don't, because if everyone goes, oh, I don't really fancy that, then uh, that doesn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. it might matter to them. It doesn't matter to me. Um, but I'll, so I'll give you an example of uh, where we can actually help is a food tour company, again, um, uh, might run a tour within the urban area of Glasgow, for example. And because it's only going to be three or four hours long, you can buy that. Um, you, you're, you, you get 
six or seven people together and you will be able to pay for that tour guide because you only need them for three or four hours. So that food tour company could run a reasonably viable business within the urban area. But if, for example, you wanted to incorporate into that experience going and visiting a distillery that was 100 miles away, well, you can't, put the, you can't take the tour guide with you because you're going to have to pay for that tour guide for all those additional hours that they are traveling. Um, so one of the things that we've been looking at is how you can have a human delivering the experience within a, for part of the experience, and then you become effectively self-guided for the parts that you know, would, would not otherwise be viable to have a human tour guide with you. Um, so I think there's, a, there's kind of areas like that. But the, I mean, I, you know, I'll say something which, uh, as a technologist, I have to try, be slightly careful about. But effectively, I don't really know the answer to this question yet. We have built the tech. And now we're finding out where it's going to work and where it's not going to work. Now, I've got some ideas, but they're, they're just ideas. Mm -hmm. So we are going to have to spend the next two years evaluating what works and what doesn't work. And that, that's kind of interesting. Um, so, I, so I think um, a, you know, a good example of uh, a, a place that may work, and this is the reason why I've mentioned it, is food tours because they're very navigational. Um, so they're very much go here to here to here. Uh, and other places that it may work very well are taxi tours. So when you might get into a taxi for an afternoon and, and, and go to one location, then another location. Um, so the navigation-oriented tours are exactly the kind of tours where AI tour guides can, can uh, do the heavy lifting. Um, some of the other experiences that are uh, storytelling in the first person uh, probably less so. And things like activities, like white water rafting and all that kind of thing, absolutely not. We're not going to get into that mm -hmm. at all. Um, yep. You know, so that's, that. you know, the humans, humans, humans will keep on operating that. So I, I suppose uh, there's two things that come to mind. I suppose, in a way, uh, it's a little bit like, uh, and forgive me here, I'll, I'll come more to light when I finish this, this, what I'm trying to say, but um, a little bit, it could be a little bit like virtual tours in terms of some people could charge for it, make some money from it, etc. but others may offer it for zero price, but it's more of a lead-in tool to then have a, an experience with an actual human. Uh, so that could be one area, I suppose. It would, it would, people can maybe think about driving it that way, more of a lead-in tool, do you think? Or Yeah, I, I mean, I think, um, you know, I'm... I, the, the human is a really important part of the experience, mm -hmm. but the human is also the expensive part of the experience. So what we have to do is understand what value that human brings for the cost that they bring. Mm -hmm. And the best example of this is when everything went uh, on, on the web in 2000. Um, actually, you know what? The web is just not as good as a human travel agent. If you... Uh, if you go to a human travel agent, they will give you a better service than online. But online was cheaper, was immediate, you felt in control. So it it became the mainstream solution. Um, yeah. So so I so I so it's not it's not because this is better or worse. In fact, this is there's a very good chance that this kind of AI tour guide thing is going to be a worse experience than a human. But actually. That's the same with web versus human travel agents. In the end, it's going to be more convenient, cheaper. So the price actually does make a, a you know, the, does enable us to sort of get into that kind of mainstream market. Uh, you know, I think the luxury end will just, will stick with human tour guides. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And I suppose because you, know, you mentioned there storytelling and it's going to be a lot about that to make this work it's not just i suppose tour guys who could create these products it could be anyone who just literally has a good story to tell because they and it could be individuals as well i suppose because you no know, they don't need to necessarily be like i say a tour operator it could just be myself if i had a good story about glasgow i could go out create my own tour stick it on otura yeah have sarah you no know, distribute out that that out and, and, and run it from there so yeah i mean our um our focus is also beyond tour operators has been sort of the, the travel brands like airlines and hotel chains. 
Um, so you could create a, a branded airline experience in a city. So if that if, it, if an airline flies to 25 cities, then they could create experiences in 25 cities. Um, you know, so so we have that ability. Um, and in fact, also we want those airlines to be using the experiences that have been designed by individuals. So if you had a really good idea for an individual experience, if an airline was putting lots of people into a particular city, uh, they they may promote your route. And therefore, you would be remunerated from their traffic. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a collaborative thing, um, collaborative editing where you know, everything from individuals up to, you know, mm-hmm. airlines, hotel chains and whoever. Yeah. So I suppose then, you know, looking a little bit further ahead, if operators can offer tours on using SADA through AI, uh, being able to reach a wider audience, um, I don't know whether they're offering it for free or, or charging for it. And I suppose that's up to them if they want to. You know, uh, I imagine most people want to try and make some sort of revenue from it. So do you see, uh, well, at that point then, because of the cost will be down in terms of using AI, there'll be less operators needing to own fleets of vehicles or bus tour companies to own buses because they'll have smaller vehicles or someone can literally get into their own car and through the app, this could be delivered yeah. to them through Sarah as well. So do you, do you actually see, I suppose, the death nail in, uh, to a certain extent in terms of those type of tour companies? Um, COVID notwithstanding, obviously they have their own issues with that as well. But do you see this being something that will probably replace that side of it? Yeah. Uh, it, ownership is a very odd word in this sector because we're back to have a massive uh, change regardless of um, what I'm doing. So don't blame me. Uh, <laughs> and that is, um, if you think what a tour operator owns today, so they own three key things uh, that are that they would probably say are sacrosanct. This is absolutely mine. And that is uh, the itinerary. So they would say, this is my itinerary. This is what I have spent 10 years optimizing and it's amazing itinerary. We're going to, you know, uh, that's my itinerary. The second thing that um, tour operators today own is the price. They say, I am going to sell this for this amount of money. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then the third thing that they own today is the vehicle. So they own the minibus, they own uh, the car, or whatever it is. Um, now, if you think about those three things, the itinerary, the price, the vehicle, will those change in the next few years? So first of all, the, the platform will own the itinerary, not the tour operator. And that has already started with Get Your Guide and with Locals, where Mm -hmm. the the itinerary is sat on the platform and the tour guide or the tour operator just delivers what the itinerary has been designed to do. So so that's that's a shift that's happening already. Um, Okay. Uh, The price, well, we've already talked about the price. The price could go to zero or, or near zero. And then thirdly, the vehicles. Well, in this um, new world of autonomous vehicles um with self-driving cars etc actually the the owners of the vehicles on a consumer basis may well be google amazon apple all of those three have got large autonomous vehicle projects Mm -hmm. so you will be getting into I, a Google, Amazon, or Apple vehicle. Now, so that's what the consumer is going to be faced with. They will be faced with this opportunity to get into a Google or an Apple or an Amazon vehicle. Why would they take your vehicle if it can't compete with that? So, so, so fundamentally, the itinerary has gone from the tour operator, the price has gone to zero, and the vehicles no longer need to be owned by the tour operator. In fact, they're going to be so expensive that very unlikely to be owned by the tour operator. That is, that's where we're at. So mm-hmm. that's a fundamental shift in ownership. Yeah, is, I remember from yeah, yeah, I remember from the last talk that we had that we, you mentioned that saying, so, you know, even just from you know, us owning cars and everything else, just generally that's going to change. You no, know, it's we're literally just going to phone a number or. or press a button in an app our car, our car will turn up we'll get into it we'll do what we need to do and then it will return back home wherever it wherever it came from and i suppose that's that's going to be the future so yeah well that's the that's one of the futures i mean mm-hmm. the futures don't just materialize by themselves they have to be built so mm-hmm. so if if we don't collectively like that future then we can take we can redesign it okay so this is you know we we can change it we're quite a small 
uh, sightseeing industry. If we don't like that, then help me and we will do something else. Um, so, for example, one of the things that I've, I'm looking at is, we, so we can always talk about these things called robo-taxi. So a robo-taxi is like a, a taxi that is driven by a robot. But these vehicles are going to be really kind of like getting in a public transport. They're going to be pretty dirty. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to be the platform that you are going to want to use to deliver your amazing luxury sightseeing experience that you've designed. So, so we need another vehicle. We need a, we know we need another vehicle that can compete with the robo taxi. Um, uh, but if you know. Um, that that sub, that's a that's a future we could collectively build. Um, you know, we we could we could go out there and build one and buy ten thousand of them and make them available to small local tour operators, um, mm -hmm. and then deliver reasonably good um, robo taxi, but amazing experiences. And that's what you know. That's what we need to. That's what we're all about. It's about uh, experience delivery. So I, I'm not. I'm not a. a yeah. I'm not a sort of a doomsayer relating to the future because I, I, I'm sitting here trying to build the future. So I've got a pretty good idea what's coming. Um, so, you know, uh, people might say, God, Alex, what are you doing? And I'll go, well, I, I'm, I'm doing it for everyone. So if you don't like it, get involved and tell me what I'm doing wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in five years from now, how do you see the, the relationship between the human delivered experience and the digital ones? And I'll be touched on it slightly, but how, how do you see that that, that, that basically that relationship developing over time yeah well I, I sort of think that ai tour guides um will will take the mainstream experiences sightseeing experiences within cities um so i think you'll still have humans uh doing luxury but i think i think the the, the end of the it's going to be the end of the mainstream tour guide now the mainstream tour guides today only really get their revenue by having 20 or 30 people in a group at a reasonably low tour price. It's those, it's those tour guides that are going to be hit by AI tour guides first. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so I think we'll have, yeah, five years. I think the main, mainstream sightseeing will be uh, AI tour guides. It may be me, it may be another company, who knows? Uh, but, you know, that's not something you can hold back. Um, that AI generally is getting better at uh, speaking. You can even get AI to speak with a Scottish accent. Um, it <laughs> understands, uh, you know, you can have, it's, it's really just about being, designing what the experience is going to be, you know, and I think that's, yeah. um, you know, I think that's just where that's going to, where it's going to end up. Um, is that a, is that a, a good thing? I don't know, but it is, what it is yeah. quote you yeah you can't that. i suppose you can't uh, <laughs> can't stop change from happening it's, it's we've had this time and time again over the last 20 30 yeah. years every time something new comes out or uber for example came out completely revolutionized the taxi side side of things whether you liked it or not it happened no it's, yep. it's, it's, it's always going to happen so i think you can i think i mean the way you can get the change to happen the way you want it is the is by talking to people like me and just engaging while we're actually building this technology that everyone's going to be using in three, four, five years time. Mm -hmm. um, because I don't want to turn up either with a product and everyone goes, God, I really hate that. <laughs> doesn't all yeah. that doesn't work or whatever. So we need these early partnerships. Um, but, and that's the, that's the best way to influence the future. Um, you know, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, I don't think, um, yeah, I don't think everyone's really kind of understood the, the, the massive shift that this that happens when we start talking about digital delivery of experiences rather than human delivery. It makes just everything completely uh, open to innovation. Um, so, for example, we can just start personalizing the experience based around someone's interests. And that's something you just couldn't do it with a human tour guide. Um, so the, the, the significance of this change, um, and I do appreciate that I'm – being filmed so therefore you, you can play this back in five years time okay, alex <laughs> what are we talking about um but you know the the um this this you know the the logical so the logical end point of all of this ai stuff that's happening in the consumer space is that ai tour guides are going to take over human tour guides mm -hmm. i suppose it's uh to a lesser extent it was no different from when not not that it replaced tour guides but when audio tours came out i uh, know I'm sure people thought that's never going to take off. No one, who would want to take out an audio tour? 
people do, uh, and I yep. suppose it's, it's it's just going to be no different from an AI tool. Well, yeah, I mean the the the, the fundamental difference between an AI tool and a, an audio tool is an audio tool is um, is a produced experience. So you know it's going to be two or three hours long because you know how long it was written, or maybe even just forty minutes, thirty minutes, um, mm. and it's normally got very high production values. So you interview locals, you kind of you get a whole kind of it's it, it's it is a produced piece of content and an ai tour guide is much more a sort of sort of a safe person who's in your phone who is telling you you know what you've got to get moving now because the traction that you're going to later on is going to be last has last entry at 4 p.m so therefore if you don't leave this here now you're not going to be able to get there by a certain time so it's guiding you it's 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 a very different kind of an experience to an audio tour which is a as i said a produced experience yeah but yeah yeah. but yeah i guess the same arguments will apply but um yeah no it's interesting alex Uh, uh, part of me loves where the technology is going and and i know i'm i never shy away from change i like to see when uber came out i use uber all the time so i think it's just an easier platform to use i I love it when i'm in london and all these other places as well so but I am also in the other fence of no hearing some tour guys, you know, there's all these things that are coming out to, it seems to hinder tour operators or feels like it seems to hinder tour operators. Yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of people nervous out there. So hopefully there's there's going to be some sort of middle ground where tour operators can still make good revenue from an AI tour guide from something they develop themselves while even making even more money because it's going to be more, uh, it's going to be more rare to take out a human sort of face-to-face tour or a human interacting tour. So they can be more luxury. They can be, higher in price and and and, and maybe that's the balance uh, and, and that's where operators can make more money i so. think operators can make money out of this um but they have to do it by disrupting themselves now bigger companies mm-hmm. are quite used to disrupting themselves but smaller companies don't tend to do that um yeah so it's an interesting it's an interesting mm-hmm. Um, and that's the reason why I was talking about the food tour example, where the food tour company may still be running tours using humans within the within the city confines, but the trip to go out to the distillery is where you put the AI tour guide, so that you as a company have kind of begun to understand what an AI tour guide can do, and then once you've used once you've grown in a bit of confidence that it's going to work for your trips out to the distillery, mm-hmm. you then go, oh, actually, you know what, I can run these things within the city. And do you know what? I can run in five cities because I don't actually now need to be. So I can now go, if, I, if I'm based in Glasgow, I can now choose every single city and town in Scotland if I wanted to because I don't actually have to be physically present now to operate these tours. I can now just do it. So, so it, it's, it's, just a different, it's just a different business, a different business model. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the really fundamental problem, I think, that the tour operators are going to have with it is that it's not a technology that people can just go and do themselves. Um, what I mean by that is, and, and I know you spent many years working as a, a website designer. You know, if you if if you as a tour operator wanted a website, you can go to a Glasgow tour, a web designer and get a, a get a website built, and it's going to be an amazing website. Um, but these these platforms, AI tour guides, are so uh, tech intensive that they are not something that a local company would have a version of. So you so it's going to end up with sort of the dominance of platforms because that's just how it's going to be. So you're going to end up with a handful of companies who can do this. Not every single local web designer has got a solution yeah. that they can do this, they can do. So there is a, there is a, a challenge here in that the, you know, that, that m- will mean that there's going to be some centralization of power, which we all know is not quite what we want. So, yeah. Interesting well, as you can. It certainly is, and, and as you can imagine, we've had quite a number of questions come in um, uh, through the various channels and on Travel Massive as well uh, from a few folks. So we'll, uh, if you don't mind, we'll quickly go through them uh, as quickly as we can. Ian, who's the founding member of Travel Massive, has actually submitted eight questions himself, so <laughs> it just shows you he's, he's engaged. But we'll start off with some of the, the other ones uh, first. Um, so Louis, uh, I don't know if this is something... I've, I've just read, I, I've just found the questions. Someone has just, who's, yeah, this, who's just said... Jeff Spence just said, I think I will just give up. Jeff, sorry, mate. <laughs> <I'm> like, 
<laughs> yeah, Jeff, don't worry, don't worry. Uh, for, for the type of tours that you do, I know Jeff well for the type of tours that he does. I don't, I don't think, uh, oh, an AI could be used, but uh, uh, the human element is always going to be there, and we'll come on to that, I'm sure. So, Louis, as, as his note has asked, uh, and who has the best AI currently? No, the big three. No, you're obviously developing your own one. No, is there. Who, who would you consider as at the forefront, forefront of this technology? Yeah, so the so the, so these digital humans are, I mean, the, you know, the the kind of digital humans that you might think about today are uh, organized. You know, are, are, are technologies like um, Alexa, Siri, um, Cortana, Bixby. You know, sort of all of the uh, big tech companies have got their own kind of voice assistant, um, mm -hmm. and, and then and then. These will be turned into digital humans later down the road by using holograms, et cetera. So this is a so actually the big technology companies have got it. My bet, because as a startup entrepreneur, you're always making bets. My bet is that they are producing technology that's very horizontal, which means that it's going to be um, used for all sorts of different purposes. And I'm just trying to solve the sightseeing use case. Mm -hmm. So I'm very, very vertical. And what that means is that I will be able to do a, a, a solution that works for sightseeing, but won't work for, you know, answering questions about recipes and all the other things that you expect kind of Alexa and all the other things to do. Um, so so I, it will be, uh, you know, uh, it's, it, that's the interesting battle is between vertical and horizontal yeah. in this space. Yeah. Another, all, all, the big um, companies, all the big companies have got to play. And that is where the concern is, because if we don't get this right, um, it will be Amazon, Microsoft, yeah. Google, yeah. And, and all of their digital humans that will be doing this, mm. not, uh, not us in the sightseeing industry. Yeah, yeah. We've well, got another, um, unfortunately I don't have the name, but it's a LinkedIn user. Um, is adding AR glasses, is that going to help accelerate this at all? Do you think that's going to be part of the, the AI experience? Yeah, um, I think so. I think, I mean, I, I'm not a big fan of this whole virtual reality because, what, but I am very interested in augmented reality, AR. Um, and the reason why I don't want virtual reality is because I want the human who's taking the experience to actually physically be moving around the place. Mm -hmm. Virtual reality is much more stable. You know, you're in one spot. That's fine. But so augmented reality, I'm actually very positive about because that enables you to get out and and, um, and and experience the world, which is what we're trying to do ultimately is get people out experiencing cities. And so AR is certainly something that is um, um, something, something we're, you know, we, that should be incorporated within that. And I think what we're trying to do right now is build the foundations. So you have an AR experience. Well, by us having this digital human called Sara, well, Sara might be the person who's introducing something to you in an AR way. And that's the reason why we focused on building her sort of profile now is because it's her who will be doing that. So if, if we see an AR opportunity, we'll take it. We're not doing that at the moment, actually. We're not doing anything in AR, but um, definitely on the lookout mm. for things. I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in holograms right now. That's what I'm really <laughs> interested in. There's all sorts of ways of getting holograms to work. Um, and that might also give me with 5g which is another thing that we should talk about probably so 5g is going to change tour guiding too it's all coming along at the same time um we might be able to have actually the tour guide uh with the customer but in a hologram rather than uh physically with them so i've, I've got kind of other ideas as to how we might get how we might get tour guides back in the game using oh, AR. I, I, yeah. I remember you speaking about that before and it's like you no know, having my tour guide for example sitting in in their bedroom, say, for example, um, but they're actually delivering their tour either as a hologram or some other format to yep. uh, 50, 100 people or whatever it would be on a tour because it's all happening sort of within their vehicle or something like that. So it's, it could be another, another way to do it. I mean, the fundamental issue and the reason why I started down this track in the first place is because the tour buses are going to be smaller. So today you have large tour buses that have got 30, 40, 50 people in. And therefore, you can economically put a tour guide in there for, for a mainstream experience. Uh, with autonomous vehicles that are going to be here in five years' time, they would be much smaller vehicles. So you've immediately got the problem that you're, they're not economic to put a human tour guide in each vehicle. So that's, mm -hmm. that's, your, that's the first 
fundamental that's got nothing to do with what I'm doing. It's got just to do with autonomous vehicles. They're going to be smaller. So you can't economically put the tour guide in each mm -hmm. vehicle. Yeah, true. So you true. have to have an alternate. Yeah. We've still got quite a few questions, so I'm going to uh, go through these as well. Um, Denise Boats, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Um, would you not say that this type of thing is, is too impersonal? People want to hear mm -hmm. and engage, to, to feel the experience, connect with them personally, um, or connect with that personality. Again, I suppose it goes back to the argument of an audio tour. You don't really get that in an audio tour either, but you no, know, what do you feel? And I'm sure this is a, a thought that a lot of operators, or even customers may even feel this as well. So, Yeah, I mean, so for example, let's say a Chinese person came to Glasgow. Uh, and the tour guide doesn't speak Chinese. Well, how personal would that be? That's mm -hmm. not going to be personal at all. Whereas Sarah can speak 17 languages, including Chinese. So immediately you can give uh, a, pers a more personal experience because you can communicate with them. Um, secondly, we are storing uh, a lot of information about people's profiles. Um, I'm just slightly careful about how I say this. Um, and therefore, we learn about individual characteristics over time. One of the biggest issues with tour operating today is that um, you have this cold start issue. So imagine you've gone on holiday to New York, and then six months later, you're on holiday in Glasgow. Well, the Glasgow tour operator has not got any learnings from when you went to New York. You may have done something in New York and someone may have gone, ah, well, when they're in Glasgow, they're going to like this. Now, that's so we do have all these methods with data to start trying to join that up and create a much more personalized experience, except the difference between personalization that I'm talking about and the personalization that everyone else talks about on the web is everyone else is talking about the personalization of retail. So they're talking about you should try this if you previously like that mm -hmm. but i'm talking about changing the actual experience because we're digitally delivering the experience we can go oh this person likes uh farmers markets let's um let's spend an hour at the farmers market rather than the 20 minutes than we thought we were going to spend um yeah. and how do we know they like farmers markets because we know that because when they were in new york they liked going to the farmers market so we can personalize yeah. using data um, and, and I should just say this carefully, we can do that in a GDPR way because that, that's a really important part of what we're doing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is making that data accessible to the customer so that they can actually see how, how the uh, personalization is working. Yeah, excellent. Well, I've got some more questions. Um, I'll come to Ian's uh, eight questions, or so I might not <laughs> go through them all, but I'll go, I'll go through them shortly. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to find one here. Um, do, 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 do. Frank, uh, no, sorry, Jay Monroe Mitchell. How long do you believe it will take customers to feel comfortable before taking a ride in an autonomous vehicle? I suppose that's a good question. Oh, that is a good question. Um, so I, yeah, so that, I mean, I've been in a couple of uh, autonomous vehicles and I've been, actually I've been two and I've only had one accident. So that's a pretty good percentage so far. <laughs> <laughs> I've wanted two chats. That's not a vote of confidence there, Alex. Um, so, so yeah, uh, uh, it's an interesting. It is an interesting question how you um, how you get you know the the, the behaviour everyone to feel confident about it. And and actually, I do think that sightseeing is going to be one of the first movers. So I I, I wrote an article last year about uh, why sightseeing will. Uh, be ahead of robo taxis, which is kind of the, the more public uh, facing taxi concept that everyone's pushing on. Um, mm. And we, and so I think sightseeing might be one of the ways that we can introduce autonomous vehicles to the general public because we can do fixed routes, uh, we can do low speed, we can start and stop at the same place, so we can have a, a member of staff there. So all these things that a robo taxi can't do. Um, so so I think that so I think sightseeing. Um, Will be there. Will be ahead of robo taxis. Robo taxis are coming in many locations in 2023, 2024. Um, I'm still wearing my T-shirt from um, from two years ago that says 2025. So if you're asking me to plug plug a date, I I'm saying that um, we should be um, ready with autonomous vehicles by 2025. Um, but 
there's a, the, the key thing right at the moment is that I've spent most of today talking about AI tour guides, and AI tour guides is a slightly separate thing. So AI tour guides are taking that experience, but out of the autonomous vehicle. The autonomous vehicle just gives it complete um, ability to deliver all sorts of kind of experiences, including uh, much longer distance experiences. Uh, but AI tour guides are going to be here now because they're here now and they're much shorter you know two three hour kind of urban sightseeing experiences like like a, a tour guide would sell today mm -hmm. um, so 2025 is the date that i've been saying for uh, autonomous vehicles <laughs> got the t-shirt <laughs> well I, I i made a prediction a couple of years back that something somebody like facebook would buy TripAdvisor, so i've got three years left on that one i think so <laughs> i'm in the same boat so yeah uh, face face uh Facebook has begun to build a local database of places to go. So because they've got, you know, they've got that. So there's a number of companies who've got the similar, similar kind of data. Yeah. 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 So Frank, uh, well, I mean, one of our, our, our uh, members who comes along quite a lot, especially to the, the live events, whenever we can run them again, um, he's always he's basically just saying is what I think a lot of people are saying is there will always be some sort of human element at some point. Um, people will always want that. No airlines outsource bookings, check in boarding yep. passes to the consumer, but still plenty of people demand travel agents um, to handle their, their more bespoke and detailed requirements. So um, that will always happen for tour operators, whether um, AI is here or audio tours are here or whatever. There's always going to be something uh, or people yeah, always I, I want think, that human I element. Think, so. I think you can tell that to all of the uh, lift attendants that you see in all the lifts in all the office mm. blocks. Yeah, you don't see many exactly. lift attendants nowadays, do you? Yeah, um, <laughs> very true. <yeah. laughs> um, I, I, you're right. I mean, the, the fundamental reason people travel is is to understand culture and understand, um, you know, just the human is an important part of this. So we absolutely can't remove the human. Um, but what we have to do is reintroduce the human in a way that makes sense. And the the the, the, I come back to my previous point, which is that the vehicles are fundamentally smaller, so therefore you're not mm -hmm. going to be able to put a tour guide in each vehicle. So what, once you've got that as a working assumption, you then have to work out, well, okay, well, do we either replace the human uh, using AI, which is one way of doing it, or do we beam the tour guide into the vehicle using a hologram and 5G, which is all coming? Um, you know, so what, what is the method? Because what you can't do now is put the tour guide in the vehicle because the vehicle is smaller. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't have the answer to all those questions. I I I, I um, was thinking about you know going to dinner with locals. Well, in London, the tourists all go to hotels that are in the city centre, and the the cut the, the the locals who want to have tourists in their house and have dinner are all living in the suburbs. Well, a tourist doesn't want to go from the city centre to the outskirts because they're not confident that they can get back to their city centre hotel. Now, in an autonomous vehicle world, they can get back to the hotel. So all of a sudden. As a result of this, we can get more people going to the outskirts and having dinners with locals. Well, so when we start saying, well, it's all going to be anti-human, this is no humans. Actually, I can reel off tens of ways that you can introduce humans back into the experience yeah. so that people continue to get their, mm -hmm. um, you know, human to human experience, which I hope will come back to being important. I, in COVID, it doesn't seem to be as important as it was, but I, I hope, I'm sure, in three or four years' time, we'll be back wanting to have dinners with locals, I'm sure. you know. Yes, here's so Ovi. Um, okay, I'm going to go through some of Ian's questions before we wrap up. So um, the first one, he, I think he was making a bit of a joke, is how can you how can you be sure that his questions are being written by an AI? <laughs> Ooh, um, yeah, there have been some good AIs that can do things like questions and answers. Um, uh, yeah. Um, I'm I'm fairly sure that Ian is a robot. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure he's. Yeah. I mean, he's I, a robot. I agree. Not me. I agree. <laughs> uh, second question. Ian, Ian mentions... being the uh, founder of Travel Massive, of course. Yes, yes. Uh, he's always no. He's he's in silly o'clock at the moment, and he's, yeah. he's still up watching this. So, um, but his second question is saying, you no, know, um, we're seeing the rise of deep fake videos. And for those who don't know what deep fake videos is, it's basically superimposing your face on a movie star. For example, there's I have apps on my phone that do it, and it, it's incredible how accurate it can be. So, uh, no, they can make anything look real, as Ian is saying. Do do you think this is a tool that will harm? or aid tourism marketing? Will, will it be harder to distinguish what is real and what's fake? Um, do you think that's, that's a good thing? Or? Yeah, I mean, we're talking about experiences where we take people out into the real world and navigate mm -hmm. them. So um, 
that this is not a virtual experience like if you're stuck in your home like we were doing covid lockdown this is getting out into the real world experiencing it um so is it is it um you know th so that's so th that from that perspective i'm i'm selling a real world experience and i think that's mm -hmm. that's the um that's where sort of the similarity with tour guide led experiences you know that's why you know you, you think it's the same but um I, I, I don't see there's much of an opportunity of faking things. I mean, one of the things that we've just introduced on our platform is that when you design a route, you actually have to have a second person uh, go on that route and go and verify that it is a real route. Um, so that should actually help with our sort of qu uh, quality issues as well, mm. um, you know, because it enables that level of protection that we can go oh well this has been uh, checked in fact we've got our current process is that we um check every 18 months but we're not 18 months old yet so i haven't actually done that twice yet but theoretically we are going to have humans checking that the route's are real so therefore it shouldn't be a um a, you know that shouldn't come up really. yeah uh, your first question was, should there be a code of ethics for AI and travel? No, should customers be able to opt out of their data points being collected, et cetera, et cetera? So do you think that should be in place yeah. as well? So the, in terms of ethics, there are some ethics that have been written about digital humans. And the only one that I can remember off the top of my head, but it, but it was probably also the most important one, is that you have to disclose to the customer that you're not a human. So Sara mm -hmm. has to say to the customer, to the user, by the way, I'm not human, or just doesn't quite say it like that. But she does. She does have. She has to disclose that she's not a human, and that is the most important ethical rule, I think. Uh, so we're not trying to fake a human here. We are, mm -hmm. you know, we are. We're, yeah. we're very much saying, you do know you're talking with a robot. Our travel. His next question. Our travel bloggers doomed because AI will write better con, con, uh, content that converts better. Can AI write a human story or is it just capable of short descriptions and things? So that's a really good question. I mean, yeah. I've been looking at all of these uh, trip planning startups from the last five, mm -hmm. 10 years. And fundamentally, the majority of trip planning startups have failed. And the reason why they failed is because they were trying to use AI to design the route. Mm -hmm. And I've said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. Uh, I said, we want humans. We want people who are experts in their destination to design these routes, mm -hmm. and then we're using AI to deliver it. But AI does not design the route. So we are using the, so in fact, actually, this is great news for travel bloggers and uh, travel writers and guidebook writers and um, uh, DMOs, because they can now design routes that they can make available to their to their audiences. Um, so I, I, I actually think this is, a, this is a positive thing for travel bloggers. In fact, this, this could be an amazing thing. Um, mm -hmm. So, because we're not using AI to write routes, we're not yeah. ad hoc creating routes. We are using humans to design the routes because they are the person who absolutely understands their destination. And yeah. travel bloggers uh, don't necessarily have to. You know, they they might not be. In, they might be in a destination for a short length of time, but they might that might be just long enough to know enough to to write a route or design a route for that destination. Yeah. Um, and they can also take the tourist uh, tourist arts perspective and go and test other people's routes and go and work out if they're any good because we're we're paying travel bloggers to do that um, so yeah there's a lot I think this is a good opportunity for travel bloggers not mm -hmm. not a not a problem for them yeah um, I'll I'll skip a couple of his questions but there's um, a couple here that I want to ask before we finish up, because I know I'm taking up quite a lot of your time now, is what percentage of the traveler's journey is currently touched by AI, and what do you predict in the next five years? I that's something you can Well, ask. that's a good question. Um, I mean, if you think, what, what percentage of what, what, what by miles? So if, you, if you get in an airplane, I bet you make quite a lot of that is by AI. So as I say, 95% of your journey is uh, AI touched at the moment. Um, I, the, at the moment, AI is one of those things that you don't really hear about because it's such a fundamental baseline technology that you don't really um, un you don't hear about it as a consumer. So you don't really know when it's being used and when it's not being used. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it can be used in such a um, 
it can be used in, 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 in ways that the consumer would just never notice. So therefore, it's impossible really to answer that question. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, even even when you, uh, as a consumer, you write a review on a hotel that you stayed in, there will be an AI that reads your review and is working out whether or not you were positive or negative about that place. And if you were negative, they might escalate it to the um, hotel management. Now that that's AI, but you as a consumer, you're just you're just writing a review. You don't know uh, you don't know if there's any AI involved or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And his last question, and it's the last one I'll ask you, is. What's the most amazing thing that you hope that AI can solve in travel? Oh, that's quite a good question, really. I don't know. What's the most amazing thing? Mm-hmm. I, I would, I, I, the one thing that I'm sort of drawn to is this concept called the connected trip. So, mm-hmm. and, and connected trip is something that the airlines and the OTAs are very, very keen about. So why is it that you get off the airplane and you, get into your ground transportation and you go to your hotel, why is it that those transactions can't speak to each other? So if your airplane is late, that the ground transportation knows that you're late and then the hotel knows that you're checking in a bit later. Mm-hmm. Why don't they, Why can't they just communicate? And um, I think there's a very good chance that this kind of, this whole autonomous vehicles and AI that comes with it will enable the way to deliver the connected trip. And I think if we can if we can just reduce some of that friction from traveling, I think that'd be that'd be quite exciting. Yeah, I think that, I think that would be amazing if that would happen. Um, being able to tell the next person or the next chain along to say, okay, you know, the flight's been delayed or the car's been delayed, there's been an accident somewhere, this mm. person's going to not not be able to check in for an yep. hour or two or whatever that would be. I think that would be amazing to be honest. I mean, the the, the big online travel agents are trying to solve this this connected mm-hmm. trip thing. Um, but they're doing it at, with the starting point being the flight. And mm. I think you can do it, but with the starting point being the ground transport. So it's a slightly different, um, it's a slightly different yeah. approach. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, Alex, I can't thank you enough for your time. I've taken up nearly an hour of your time, so thank you so much. And I, I'm just going to show one comment, which I think, um, I don't know the name of the person who left us, but on Facebook, Tour operations should not ignore this. You will regret it if you do. Start from start to think from a hybrid business model, digital tours and high value people guided tours. Um, and I think that's pretty much what you touched on. Uh, and it's where the the industry looks like it's going to go. Um, and it's yeah. So you don't want to people like behind. me need the tour operators. We need tour operators mm-hmm. now. So uh, we want to work with tour operators. So um, you know, if you've got any thoughts about how to do this, come and uh, you know, I I'm, I. If you look at if you look at my history of um, fifteen years running a supplier reservation system, um, suppliers and tour operators know from that that I'm not going to do something completely uh, random. So therefore, mm. it should be it. I should be the 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 company that tour operators are supporting, rather than, for example, going and supporting Google or going and supporting Microsoft or going and supporting Amazon. You know, I think because you don't quite know what they're going to do. I think um, I would hope that uh, I've built up enough sort of uh, credit in trust for me to, you know, to, to let tour operators uh, help here. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Well, Alex, thank you enough. And I suppose, and, and just from a selfish point of view, um, I suppose I, I should be a little bit worried if there's more AI tour guys. There's, I doubt AI tour guys will need any form of marketing services, so we'll need to. <laughs> no, but this is all about design. So that's why I said we want to keep the human in the design process. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I've, I know you're a designer, slightly different type of designer, but uh, it's all about design. And I think the hum- anything that's emotional has to be human. And the yeah. design of the experience therefore has to be human so if you're a designer that's great yeah. excellent excellent so if people wanted to know more about yourself or Tura or sara where should they go if you go to the autora website you can just sign up to the newsletter uh, which is only once every six weeks or something it says monthly but i don't have time to write it monthly at the moment <laughs> um uh, if you just go to the autora homepage, um and bottom of that there's a sign up thing for a uh, newsletter that's the best place and if and if you are an individual who is interested in designing some of these routes, um, then um, then give me a shout. In fact, we're, I'm still looking for someone to create a couple of example routes in Glasgow. Um, so if anyone's got any, uh, if anyone's got a few spare hours, um, mm-hmm. I'm 
delighted to sort of help you know show 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 you how to get it, get it to work in Glasgow. I should speak to my fellow travel master leader, uh, uh, Jessica. She's running some, or I was thinking about running some sort of tours in Glasgow and things like that. So um, as a sort of side project, so she could be one to maybe approach as well for that side of things. Yeah, I mean the difference between this and the P to, the P, the person to person experience is that if if you as an individual go, oh right, I really like uh, I really like rum, and I, I'm going to do a rum tour of Glasgow. Um, I don't know why I could do, that. do a rum tour of Glasgow. <laughs> but let's say you did a rum tour of Glasgow, right? Okay. Um, if you put that on, if you as an individual put that on Airbnb, you would have to block out the next 10 Saturdays if you're going to run it on Saturdays, just on the off chance that someone uh, came along and booked mm -hmm. it. Um, and so, you know, you, you as an individual sort of couldn't do that because you have to curtail your social life to do that. Whereas now you could design a rum tour of Glasgow, chuck it in a platform like Autora, although I'd hope you use a bit more um, elegance than chucking it. Anyway, put it in a platform like Autora. Mm -hmm. And now anyone can go along and do this rum tour of Glasgow whenever they want. Uh, and that that you know that's the sort of the where we're that's where we're heading. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Alex, like I say, I've taken up a lot of your time. So thanks so much for for spending the time letting us know a bit more about Autora, about Sarah and one of the possible futures of, of what are based on what's happening in the industry and what's going to be coming up. And it's certainly going to be interesting uh, to see what happens over the next five years. 2025. 2025. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll have another chat. We'll, we'll fight. What we'll do is we'll, this is the, what, the 18th of August. We'll have a chat on the 18th of August, 2025, and we'll see where we're at. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll come along in my robo-taxi. Hopefully, yes. Hopefully, by that point, we can actually meet in person again and actually do the oh, yeah, job. Yeah. So. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again, Alex, and I appreciate the time. Cheers. Cheers, Chris. Thank you. This episode of the Digital Tourism Show was brought to you today by Rentrax, fully customizable rental management systems for tour operators. You can book your free demo at rentrax.com. 